Okay, so last week I received my third box of free records from my friend Dan in California. Dan is in the process of moving to Texas, and over the past few months he's been getting rid of a number of records from his record collection, and I've been the very happy recipient of quite a few of them. First up from this box are two obscure folk albums from the Electra label that were released in the late 60s. The one on the left is Diane Hildebrandt's Early Morning Blues and Greens, and the one on the right is Steve Noonan's self-titled album which includes a lot of collaboration with Jackson Brown. I'm not really familiar with either one of these albums, but they both look very interesting, and I'm looking forward to checking them out. Next up are two albums from David Blue. The one on the left is his self-titled debut album for Elektra, and the one on the right is his second album entitled These 23 Days in September, which he released on Reprise in 1968. Here are two obscure psychedelic albums from 1968. The one on the right is Toad Hall's Class of 68 on Liberty Records, and the one on the left is The Moons Without Earth on Imperial. Here are two albums from Kaleidoscope. The one on the left is called Incredible, and it came out on Epic in 1969. The one on the right is their rare reunion album called When Scopes Collide, which was released in 1977 on the Pacific Arts label. Here are two early electronic albums. The one on the left is Sea Drift, and it's credited to the Dusk Till Dawn Orchestra. I realize that this album was masterminded by Mort Garson, who made a number of electronic uh, Moog synthesizer albums in the late 60s. For instance, um, Black Mass Lucifer and Zodiac's Cosmic Sounds and The Wazard of Is. And I'm pretty sure there's no actual electronic music on Sea Drift but I'm still curious to check it out. There's definitely electronic stuff on the album on the right, which is Pierre Henry's Le Voyage, an electronic score based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which was released on Mercury Records. Here are three albums from Graham Bond. The one on the left is Love is the Law, which was released on Pulsar Records. The other two were released on Mercury. The one in the middle is Holy Magic. And the one on the right I've heard is a really cool prog album. It's called We Put Our Magic on You. Here are two albums from Scott Walker. The one on the left is Scott Walker Volume 2, and the one on the right, obviously, is Scott Walker 3. And these were both released on Smash Records. Here are two albums from John Kay. The one on the left is material that was recorded from his pre-Steppenwolf band called Sparrow, and this album was released on Columbia in 1968 after Steppenwolf became popular as a means of capitalizing on their success. And the one on the right is John Kay's second solo album, which is called My Sport in Life, and it came out on Dunhill Records in 1973. Here are several um, soundtrack albums from the late 60s and early 70s. The one on the top left there is The Wild Racers on Sidewalk, which includes a number of songs by Davey Allen and the Arrows. Beside that is Three in the Attic from 1969, I believe, on Sidewalk. And this soundtrack was done by Chad and Jeremy. Bottom left there is a soundtrack for a French movie called Zeta, which was released on the uh, Philips label. And on, bes on the right beside that is a very cheesy looking soundtrack called Outlaw Riders, which frankly looks like a combination of Easy Rider and The Wild Bunch. And that soundtrack came out on MGM Records in 1971. Up next are three albums by The Ventures. The first one is Underground Fire from 1968. This includes songs like Born to be Wild, Sunshine of Your Love, and Light My Fire. Here's New Testament from 1971. What's interesting about this particular copy of the album is that it's a Japanese pressing, as you can see here. And from 1974, we have the Jim Croce songbook. I have to admit that I'm not terribly excited about the idea of the Ventures performing Jim Croce songs, but the fact is that the Ventures were famous for keeping up with the times musically, and I guess an album like this is the logical result of doing that during the singer-songwriter era. Here are two albums by Chris Yolden, who is a member of Savoy Brown before he went solo. Nowhere Road and City Child are the name of them, and they both came out on London in the early 70s. Here are both albums by Eyes of Blue. They're called Crossroads of Time and In Fields of Arda. These are regarded today as sort of low-key classics of psychedelic and progressive rock, and they both came out on Mercury in the late 60s. Here's an interesting but very unknown group called Fresh. Their album is called Fresh Out of Borstal and the album includes songs by Jagger and Richards as well as Peter Sarsted, and it came out on RCA Victor. On the left there is Bootleg Him, which is a collection of live recordings by Alexis Corner, and beside that is Sea Shanties, which is a classic psychedelic album by the British group High Tide. This album came out here in the U.S. on Liberty Records. Here are three folk albums by women artists. 
The top left one there is Laura Nero's second album, Eli and the 13th Confession. This is the British copy that came out on CBS. Beside that is Bridget St. John's album, Songs for the Gentle Man, which came out on Elektra. And in the foreground is an interesting and very much unknown duo named Lily and Maria. This album came out on Columbia Records and is supposedly a combination of folk and psychedelic pop. Looks very interesting to me. Here are two albums by an artist named Anna Black. The one on the left is Meet Anna Black. The one on the right is Thinking About My Man. Both of these came out on Epic in the late 60s. On the left here is an artist called Show of Hands. Their album is formerly Anthrax, and it came out on Elektra. On the right, the artist is Stone Pillow, and the album name is Eliezer Circus. This came out on London Records. On the left is the self-titled debut album by Sweetwater. It's their first of three albums, and it was released on Reprise in 1968. On the right is Harvey Mandel's album Cristo Redentor on Philips Records. On the left is John Renborn's album Pharaoh Annie. Renborn was a member of Pentangle, and he released this album on Reprise in 1972. To the right is that is Neil Diamond's second LP, Velvet Gloves and Spit, on Uni Records. On the inside cover of this album, I was first struck by the very ugly-looking mannequins, and I was struck again by the very ugly-looking chest hair on our star singer there. Here are three obscure early 70s acts. The one on the left is Savage Grace, who were apparently a Detroit progressive rock group. I haven't really heard of them much until I did a little bit of research on them. In the middle is Cyrus Fire's album Cyrus. It came out in Elektra in 1971. And beside that is another Elektra album, Good Thunder is the name of the group. Here's a very bizarre looking album, David Rose's The Velvet Beat, Lush String Interpretations of Today's Hits. And I guess the reason it's unusual is that I just can't imagine Lush String Interpretations of I Can't Get No Satisfaction or Mr. Tambourine Man. I guess I'll have to put it on my turntable and see what it sounds like. This album came out on MGM in 1965. Here are three more 70s groups. Um, Help Yourself is the name of the group on the left there. Beware the Shadow is the name of their album and it came out on United Artists. The band in the middle is called Hub and this album is called Cheetah, it came out on Capitol. And on the right is a self-titled album by Dana Cooper, it came out on Elektra Records in 1973. Here are three British Invasion albums. The one on the left is the Dave Clark Five's Glad All Over on Epic. The one in the middle is another Epic album, Live Yardbirds featuring Jimmy Page, it came out in 1972, once Led Zeppelin had become popular. And on the right is a very bizarre compilation, Best of the British Invasion on the British Pie label. Now, the reason that this album seems so weird to me is that it just contains a very strange hodgepodge of songs that masquerade under the title British Invasion. Like, it has the foundation song Build Me a Buttercup and the status quo is Pictures of Matchstick Men on the same album as Lonnie Donegan's 1959 song Does Your Chewing Gum Lose Its Flavor on the Bed Post Overnight. So it strikes me as a very bizarre collection. Anyway, in addition to the records Dan sent, he also included several issues of Rolling Stone magazine that I think are really cool. This one is this great iconic photo of Janis Joplin on the cover. Here's an ad from Terry Knight. I think it probably has something to do with Grand Funk Railroad. Here's an ad for the Doors album Weird Scenes Inside the Gold Mine, which was released after Jim Morrison died. It was a compilation album. Here's a cool cover uh, photo of Rod Stewart. Here's an interesting looking essay or a short story by Anthony Burgess, the author of A Clockwork Orange. Here's a really cool looking essay about the MC5 Shattered Dreams in Motor City. I definitely want to take a closer look at this when I get the chance. Here's a funny ad for a cheesy looking portable cassette player. Here's an ad for a Roger Daltrey solo album. Here's a cool looking article on Yes, it says the band that stays healthy plays healthy by Cameron Crowe. Here's a cool ad for the New York Rock and Roll Ensemble. And the headline reads, these four guys left Juilliard for this. It's pretty cool. Here's a really neat ad for the Cat Stevens' uh, third album, Mona Bone Jackin. It says, be the first in your block to discover Cat Stevens. And it has that trash can from the cover there. Here's a funny looking um, ad for custom amplifiers. It says, the lifetime guarantee group insurance. I'm not sure if that's a real band or not, but it's a cool photo. So again, I want to thank Dan for all the stuff that you sent. I really appreciate it. And um, that's pretty much it. Take care. Bye.